we're going to get started. So, there was a change of plan today, but instead we have uh, Eric Hoffman here with us. Uh, he did his dissertation work at the University of Colorado in Boulder. Is that correct? Yes, that's correct. Yeah. Uh, and now he is a postdoc within Einstein Fellowship, formerly at UC Berkeley and currently at the University, or, sorry, Columbia University. And today he's going to talk to us about failed supernovae. Yep. So uh, thanks for having me here, and thanks for arranging this on such short notice. Uh, I apologize if you're expecting to hear about magnetic reconnection and uh, turbulence and kinetic theory of plasmas <laughs> um, from Lorenzo. But instead, I'm going to talk a little bit about um, sort of a sequence of projects I've been working on with some people at Berkeley, Elliot Quadert, uh, Stephen Rowe, who was, a post or who was a grad student here not too long ago, um, Dan Kaysen, and then Rodrigo Fernandez. Um, who actually, I guess, is at the University of Alberta currently, also in Canada, um, on this concept uh, known as the failed supernova, um, and sort of some of the work that we've been doing to try to understand this, this phenomenon. So to summarize what I want to talk about today, um, I first just want to go over the basics of what a failed supernova actually is. Um, it's sort of self-explanatory from the title, but there's actually an interesting um, sort of secondary indication of the neutron star formation that arises from this neutrino mass loss that has some interesting implications on the appearance um, of these objects. Um, and so what I'm going to talk about is a, uh, a secondary shock that you can actually form that occurs from this neutrino mass loss mechanism. And then for the second half of this talk, uh, I'll go over some more recent work um, that I've been doing, uh, relatively more recent, um, to describe how this shock that you form from this neutrino mass loss actually propagates through the envelope of a, of a supergiant star, which can be the progenitor of one of these failed supernovae. And at the end, um, I'll summarize and conclude, and I'll take any questions. OK. So uh, the very basics of core collapse supernovae, so I'm not an expert on this, um, but the very basic idea, you have a fairly massive star, uh, reaches the point in its life where it's exhausted its supply of nuclear fuel. So it's got this incredibly dense degenerate iron core at its center, from which it can no longer extract um, any thermonuclear energy. So the core collapses. Uh, you form a neutron star uh, as the electrons and protons combine to form neutrons. Um, the neutron star that you initially form is slightly overpressured with respect to the equilibrium value that it wants to have. And so it bounces. And that bounce launches an outward propagating shock um, into the surrounding star. And so if that shock is sufficiently energetic, it runs through the overlying stellar envelope and unbinds it and gives you a successful supernova explosion. Okay. So um, what's sort of interesting about this story is that pretty soon after uh, it was sort of conceived, people realized that it was actually kind of difficult to make this work um, in practice. And the reason is that the shock that you form from this neutron star bounce typically stalls at a fairly small radius within the star, so a few hundred kilometers. Um, and the reason for that is that the overlying stellar envelope that's falling in and forming the, the neutron star at the center has some ram pressure associated with it that tends to stifle this shock. Um, and as the shock is going out, it's also passing through layers um, of heavy nuclei, and it's dissociating those nuclei, and that's also sapping energy from the shock as it propagates outwards. And so those two things, um, sort of cause this shock to just kind of sit there. And so we've seen this time and time again um, from simulations in this shock. Um, it's very hard to get it to, to run through the overlying stellar envelope and eject it in this sort of standard scenario. And so people um, have been thinking for a long time about how we can potentially revive this sort of shock. Um, and so one potential mechanism is known as a standing accretion shock instability. Um, and so if you have any sort of small amount of angular momentum um, in this infalling material, that'll induce um, sort of some corrugations on the shock front that you form. Um, and people have done some work to show that these sorts of corrugations uh, to these standing accretion shocks can be unstable. And so potentially, uh, you can sort of leak energy out uh, asymmetrically and give you some sort of asymmetric explosion. Um, there's also sort of one of the uh, more famous mechanisms for reaccelerating this the shock is through neutrino heating. Um, and so I'll actually come back to this in a minute, but as you form the neutron star, you're liberating, um, so you're fusing electrons and, proto yeah, electrons and protons to form neutrons. One of the byproducts of that nuclear reaction is the production of a neutrino. And so a lot of these neutrinos, they have such a small cross section that they just leak out of the star, but some fraction of them, up to maybe 10%, can get reabsorbed at this shock front 
and thereby redeposit uh, some energy and momentum and reaccelerate this shock outwards. And then finally, if all else fails, you can always invoke magnetic fields. And so the region behind the shock uh, is convectively unstable. And so if you have some small scale uh, magnetic field initially, you can turbulently generate uh, via some dynamo action uh, a magnetic field in the core. And that can potentially lead to some jet driven explosions, um, which can help to explain some of the more hyper energetic supernovae. OK, and so the point is, um, with increasing sophistication of, of simulations of, of core collapse supernovae, um, the jury, I think, is still kind of out on what, which of these mechanisms, um, if any, is generally responsible for producing successful core collapse supernovae. And so it sort of raises an interesting question, um, which is what happens if the shock legitimately is not revived? What happens if nothing can reaccelerate the shock through the overlying stellar envelope to give you a successful supernova? OK, so back to this simple picture, right? So the shock just continues sitting there. Um, the, oops. So the um, infalling um, gas just sort of buries this shock, gets reaccreted onto the onto the central proto neutron star. Eventually, you push the proto neutron star over the tolman hoppenheimer volkoff limit. You form a black hole, and the black hole um, just swallows the overlying stellar envelope on something like the free fall time from the surface. Okay, and so like you know, for a supergiant, that's something like a month. And so with this kind of very simple little picture. Um, failed supernovae sort of appear analogous to disappearing stars. Um, and so there's also some fairly good observational evidence um, that we're missing some supernovae uh, from the high mass end. Um, if you sort of uh, think that we understand the initial mass function fairly well, um, we're sort of not seeing supernovae from the, the highest mass stars, which seem to suggest that some of these uh, really do fail, right? There's some ob observational vindication of this. Um, and then there's one potential, and maybe two potential candidates um, that have been directly observed that people think have legitimately um, disappeared. Okay, so failed supernovae equal disappearing stars. So what's interesting is that that's actually not quite the whole story. And something interesting happens um, in between uh, the formation of this proto-neutron star um, and then the, the eventual disappearance. And the interesting thing that's in between is related um, to something that I already mentioned, which is that during the, the formation of this neutron star, um, you radiate neutrinos like crazy. And uh, even though they're very small, um, they're very energetic. And it turns out that they carry with them uh, up to a few tenths of a solar mass worth of mass energy. And so some uh, fraction of those, as I mentioned, can be intercepted at this standing shock. And that can potentially help reaccelerate the shock through the overlying stellar envelope. But the majority of them, because their cross sections are so small, once they sort of get out of the nuclear region of the, the star, uh, they simply go th past through the star completely unimpeded. And that reduction in the mass, right? So half a solar mass, um, that's actually a significant fraction of the neutron star itself. It's a fairly significant fraction of the mass of the whole star. So that reduction in the mass creates a reduction in the gravitational field which you can think of as creating a time-dependent force on the overlying stellar envelope. And so to return yet again to this simple picture, right? you have this, the neutrino production in, in the core as you're forming the neutron star. And so some fraction gets get absorbed at the shock front, but the vast majority of them simply pass through the overlying stellar envelope, don't interact with anything. They carry with them this, this mass that I'll call delta M. And that, in turn, generates some uh, response on the overlying stellar envelope, right? Because the, the stellar envelope is still sort of just sitting there because it hasn't yet been told of the fact that this uh, catastrophic thing has happened in the core and it's lost pressure support and everything. That takes a sound crossing time over, to the, over the entire length of the star before it eventually starts to fall in. Okay. So the um, sort of interesting question is then how does the star uh, respond to this neutrino mass loss? So initially, um, you can almost just think about this as like a classical physics problem. Um, you have some new force, uh, g delta m over r squared, right? Because delta m is the, the mass that you've lost. And so that's the effective force that the overlying gravitational, or sorry, that the overlying stellar envelope feels. That creates an acceleration, dv by dt. And so initially, it's sort of like the whole envelope just wants to sort of escape in the reduced gravitational field, um, which sort of makes sense. You know, you've reduced the, 
mass contained in the core, the star is suddenly overpressured and the whole thing just wants to kind of fly away. Okay, but the but that's sort of at odds with what we know is happening in the inner regions of this star, uh, where things are falling inward onto the accreting uh, soon to be black hole. All right, so like the analogous situation is on the Earth, if you reduced the mass of the Earth by 10%, the atmosphere would try to float away, but the surface of the Earth is still sitting here, which means that there's some new approximate equilibrium that the atmosphere can try to come into. Okay, and so the second um, sort of phase of this is that as this envelope is trying to escape and recede outwards, uh, this sort of inner boundary condition, the fact that the inner regions of the star are falling into the core, is then conveyed to the overlying stellar envelope uh, by the pressure gradient within the star, within the overlying envelope. And the result is that you get sort of this outward propagating pulse in the velocity and pressure that races out from the inner regions and kind of tells the envelope that's trying to recede and expand away to actually turn around, fall back in, and accrete onto the, onto the black hole. And so, um, so that was at kind of a uh, sort of broad brush level. Um, you can actually do uh, the calculations that sort of uh, justify these statements in a lot more detail, um, AKA you can use some math. Um, and it turns out to be a little bit complicated, but the way you can do this is you can consider this new gravitational term as effectively a perturbation um, that induces velocity, density, and pressure perturbations. You can then use the perturbed uh, equations of hydrodynamics, um, the continuity equation, the radial momentum equation, and the entropy equation, combine those to give a second order equation for the velocity, and then you can solve that equation by using the eigenmodes um, of the background star. And so basically, if you know the properties of the progenitor, then you can construct in general the response uh, of the star to this mass loss and get this dynamical sort of picture. And so to just give you an example of this, um, so to take as the very simplest possible case uh, for a star, let's model the star as a polytrope. Just means that P goes like rho to the gamma. Um, here I think I set gamma to 1.5, but it doesn't really matter for the details. Um, so, the, so the density is just shown by the, the black curve here, um, just scaled arbitrarily, and I'm showing the velocity on the y-axis in units of centimeters per second, and the radius on the x-axis in units of centimeters. And so this is at t equals zero just before I reduce the mass contained in the core. And so the velocity everywhere is zero because it's in hydrostatic equilibrium. And then at t equals zero, I reduce the mass and I want to see how this star responds. Okay, and just to give you an idea, the central sound speed is up here. And I also, so just for the case of concreteness, I match the properties of this polytrope to those of the sun. And so the radius of the star out here is at seven times 10 to the 10 centimeters. The central sound speed is a few hundred kilometers per second. And so if I reduce the mass, what you see is I create this little tiny blip in the velocity that starts to race out. Okay? And so initially, this thing is really subsonic. Um, so it's 1% you know, maybe the sound speed. And what that sort of does is validate um, this whole kind of perturbation theory approach that I was taking to try to describe this whole problem. But then what you see that's really kind of interesting is that near the surface of this star, things start to change pretty dramatically. And instead of going from some simple little uh, perturbation, not really simple, but some little perturbation on the star. So if you, were, if you were sort of a fluid shell in the star, down here you'd just feel a little blip and you'd kind of move back and forth and then you'd fall onto the, onto the central uh, black hole. Out here you just sort of get slammed with a big velocity kick, right? And so, if, so this is in the linear regime, right? So I dropped a lot of nonlinear terms. But if this was actually, if I had done this self consistently and included the nonlinear terms that arise in the real problem, this little velocity pulse, while being some little tiny perturbation deep in the interior, would self-consistently steepen into a shock near the outer parts of the star. Um, and you can compare this to some uh, much older work. So this is Ndoyzhin's original paper where he described this effect and realized that it was, it was something pretty interesting. Um, and so his axes are a little bit scaled from mine, but you can basically see that, that this linear perturbation theory does a really good job of recovering um, the true solution or you know, the numerical solution here that contains the, the nonlinear terms. Um, okay, so uh, the point of this is to say that, that these failed supernovae are really not uh, just disappearing stars, right? And so from this, this dynamic um, neutrino mass loss effect, what you sort of predict is that you should, um, instead of just disappearing, you form this second distinct shock 
that forms only in the, in the outer layers of the star that can then give rise to some outburst that accompanies the, dis the eventual disappearance. And so this formalism is actually kind of, um, it's not super easy to use in practice because it turns out you have to use a lot of eigenmodes of the star in order to accurately reconstruct this. But what's nice about it is that you can get a fairly good handle on the energy that's involved um, in these sorts of explosions. Um, because the energy is sort of set in the linear regime. And so the number that you end up getting out is something like 10 to the 47, 10 to the 48 ergs. Um, this, so it's just g times the mass loss squared. And then this radius here is a scale, scale height um, at a certain radius within the star that is pretty much uniform across uh, most progenitors. And the number that you get is on the order of 10 to the 47 ergs, so a few orders of magnitude below the energy involved in a typical supernova. Yeah, do you have a question? So why is it uh, the mass loss squared? Yeah, because, good question. It's because the velocity that you induce everywhere goes roughly linearly with, with the mass loss, and so the energy is just one half e squared. So you get delta m squared. Yeah. Um, so what's nice is you, is you, you can use this formalism to predict the energetics involved um, in these sorts of milder explosions that accompany failed supernovae. Um, you can also predict uh, fairly well where the shock actually forms. Um, comes roughly from this conservation uh, of wave luminosity. You can see how it sort of steepens as it goes down the density gradient. There's an approximate expression for the way by which it does that. Um, and the, so the specific progenitor that I used um, before, right, was just this polytrope. And so polytropes are sort of a roughly decent approximation for something like the helium core of a supergiant, outside of which you have this extended hydrogen envelope. Um, and so by using this um, sort of perturbation theory approach, we can actually get a fairly good handle on the initial formation of this sound pulse, this velocity pulse, uh, the steepening, the formation of the shock, and then the overall energetics involved in one of these, these explosions which is kind of nice. You said there's a thing which is also for a Yeah. Yeah, so the, <laughs> yeah, good catch. So the, that previous movie, I used sort of a, a simpler boundary condition, which is to say that the inner, the, yeah, exactly, yeah. You can actually, you can add an infall boundary condition. It complicates the math, and I was, I should have just included that, uh, but I made this movie a while ago. Um, no, not really. It, it's really, the majority of it is just set by the instantaneous, the power law, or not the power law, the density background. Yeah, the background density. Yeah. Um, okay. So, for the latter uh, half of this talk, um, I sort of wanted to talk about what, uh, so sort of what next in this whole, uh, this whole story here, right? Because so far, uh, we've described sort of Phase one, right, which is how this shock forms uh, in one of these collapsing stars, right? So for the case uh, where the star is a supergiant, the shock from this neutrino mass loss forms roughly at the edge of the helium core. Again, that just comes from the declining density profile right before you hit the hydrogen envelope. And that's at a radius of about something like on the order of the radius of the sun, 10 to the 10 centimeters, 10 to the 11 centimeters. And I think just from this sort of analytic theory and also from simulations that people have done, uh, including Rodrigo Fernandez, um, I think we have a fairly good understanding of how that works. Okay, then there's phase two, and then there's phase three, which is where the shock breaks out from the surface, creates some luminous outburst, and some recombination transient. Um, and I think the theory of this is actually um, pretty well established. People know this from the type 2p um, supernova uh, theory. Um, Dan Kaysen, uh, Stan Woosley uh, have a couple of nice papers sort of delineating this. And of course the shock breakout stuff, uh, people have, have studied a lot in the past. Um, some of this mass um, that gets hit by the shock as it accelerates near the actual photosphere of the star um, is successfully ejected. Some of it eventually falls back and gives some, some sort of fallback onto the black hole. Um, this part I think is also fairly well understood. And so there's some old work um, by Ro Roger Chevalier um, in the early 90s, talking about fallback onto, onto neutron stars. Um, there's been some more recent work um, by uh, Dan Kaysen and a couple of others looking at, at how fallback works in uh, relatively weak supernovae. But before you can get to, to parts three and four, uh, you have to go through part two, which is where this shock that you generate at the base of the hydrogen envelope then propagates all the way through the hydrogen envelope before it eventually reaches the surface and sort of informs the properties of three and four. Um, and so how does this uh, sort of work um, is sort of what I want to address in the, the remainder of this talk. So 
what does the density profile of the hydrogen envelope of a supergiant actually look like? So this is just a, a sort of fairly standard example. So this is a 22 solar mass, zero age main sequence, yellow supergiant um, that was evolved to core collapse with uh, the stellar evolution code MESA. This is by um, Bill Paxton and co. Um, and so this was done by uh, Rodrigo Fernandez, actually. Um, and so what you see over here on the left uh, is sort of the inner edge, the base of the hydrogen envelope. It's a few times 10 to the 11. And then all the way out here is where you eventually get to the photosphere. Um, and so what you see is that this, this whole density profile, almost the entire thing, is extremely well modeled uh, by a power law, okay, which is great. For, uh, for a theorist, right? We love power laws. Um, and the reason for this um, is actually pretty simple. Um, so the outer parts of this, uh, of this hydrogen envelope um, are convective. Uh, and so that means that they're essentially isentropic because you don't need a very large gradient uh, in the adiabatic equation of state in order to generate highly efficient convection. And so the, the pressure profile is basically just a, poly a polytrope related to so P equals K rho to the gamma, where K is basically a constant. Um, gamma, the adiabatic index here, is sort of regulated by uh, the competition between gas pressure and radiation pressure, which for these temperatures and densities, uh, gamma is about 1.4. And then just from the equation of hydrostatic equilibrium, um, you can show that the density should follow basically a power law. And for this case, it's roughly R goes, rho goes like R to the minus 2.5. Okay, and so, the, so the basic question then is how, how, how we're going to relate the initial shock formation to the eventual shock breakout is really just boils down to a very simple question, which is how does the shock propagate through a power law medium? So according to, to this relation, there's no termination, but the angles extend indefinitely. Yeah, so that's right. And so to be fair, there's an additional term here that becomes important when you get very close to the surface. But I guess what I mean is the vast majority of this thing is governed pretty well by a simple single power law over the whole thing. What's that? Until you become optically thin. Yes, until you get, yeah, until you get close to the surface, yeah. Yeah. It's just hydrostatic. It's also, yeah, I mean, self-gravity. Yeah, you don't have power law above the surface and stuff. Yeah. Okay, we can come back to that, but yeah. So, I want to take a like, very brief detour into something that's kind of technical, um, but will motivate sort of the, the rest of what I want to talk about, which deals with self-similarity um, and what's known as the Setoff-Taylor solution, which I'm sure many of you heard of, um, but I just want to go over it because I think it's important to point out the sort of assumptions in this. So the basic idea, right, so we have this shock that we formed. It's about to reach this hydrogen envelope where it's going to propagate through this, this power law medium. So behind it, we have some known energy, right? that I, I know from the, the sound pulse formation, right? It's 10 to the 47, 10 to the 48 erg, something like that. And then the shock is gonna run through this, this power law medium with some time dependent shock position, time dependent shock velocity. And we wanna know how these properties vary uh, as a function of time, okay? And so across this shock, we know that we have to conserve, so the shock by itself can't generate any mass, momentum, or energy. And so those quantities have to be conserved across this shock front. And what that tells us is the velocity the density and the pressure everywhere, uh, sorry, the density, the velocity, the density, and the pressure immediately behind this shock front, okay? And so if, if the shock is strong, then it tells you that the velocity just behind the shock front is just a fraction that's related to gamma times the shock velocity. The density is, again, just a number times the ambient density, and the pressure is just a number times the ram speed of the shock, okay? So if we wanna um, solve the Euler equations with this set of boundary conditions, it's kind of difficult or weird because these boundary conditions occur at a position that depends on time, which is kind of weird. Okay, but we can actually do away with this if we're sort of clever and we introduce some new variable in place of Eulerian radius, which is just R, Eulerian radius, divided by the shock position. And so if we do this, then these boundary conditions occur at a single value of this new self-similar variable, C. And additionally, we sort of just make this magic assumption that the solutions to the Euler equations that we ultimately want to solve that are going to tell us everything about the velocity, the density, and the pressure behind this shock are separable, not in time and radius r, but time and this self-similar variable xi. 
Okay? And so if we insert these expressions into the Euler equations, what we find kind of magically is that this works, namely that we recover self-consistently three ordinary differential equations for f, g, and h, provided that the shock position and velocity obey this very simple relation. Okay, so this combination of quantities here with, again, v shock is just dr shock by dt, just has to be a constant. Okay, and you can sort of rearrange this and show that this implies that the shock position varies as a power law. Okay? And so the one additional thing that we need in order to fix what this alpha thing here is, is that we assumed from the beginning that I have some known amount of energy that's going to be conserved as this thing is propagating. And so we can now take our self-similar solutions, right? So the kinetic energy is this. There's also the thermal energy, but it scales identically to this. So I can just consider the kinetic energy, right? So if I introduce my uh, solutions for the density and the velocity, I have some number that's some integral over these self-similar functions, it's just a constant, just some number. And then out front, I have something that could, in principle, depend on time, right? And it's a combination of the shock, velocity, and the position. And so if I want to conserve energy, that means that this sort of combination of parameters here um, has to be uh, equal to zero. And that tells me that this alpha parameter here is just equal to three minus n, where again, n is the density profile fall off of the ambient medium. I should have said that. And so if you just rearrange this differential equation, you find that the shock position here just goes as some simple power law in time. And this is the well-known set-off-Taylor solution. Okay. So uh, I think the easiest way to kind of visualize this, uh, how this works, is through a Lagrangian sort of formalism. So I just have a gas that's sitting here. I'm going to hit it with one of these shocks and just see what happens. Whoops, uh, maybe. Yep, there we go. Right, so it's all these uh, gas shells are getting hit by this shock as it goes out. The change in the color indicates the change in the density. So the, the material gets denser behind the shock, as it has to by virtue of the jump conditions. Um, and everywhere the gas just sort of moves out and follows this, uh, this blast wave that you've, uh, you've generated by the injection of this amount of energy. Okay? And you can see that the, the density is, extremely, is most amplified near, uh, near the shock front. It's sort of one of the features of these solutions is that all the, the mass sort of gets swept up into this really thin shell just behind the shock. And then the, this inner region here is almost completely evacuated. Okay, so that's sort of the, the way that we can potentially go about understanding how this shock is then going to propagate through this power law envelope of this yellow supergiant progenitor, right? So if you go back to that expression that I had for the uh, relationship between the shock velocity and the shock position, when n equals 2.5, the prediction is that the shock velocity should scale as the shock position to the minus one quarter power. And so is this seen? And so uh, Rodrigo Fernandez, um, in addition to just evolving these stars to core collapse, also ran some hydro simulations with flash. Um, and this is just showing the solution for the velocity that he obtains uh, from these numerical calculations. Okay? And so each different curve here just shows a different time. And so what you're seeing is this, this little discontinuity here that is the shock as it's propagating all the way out through this, this hydrogen envelope. Okay? And so again, the prediction here, if the set off Taylor solution were right, is that this thing should fall off as out of the minus a quarter power. Okay? And I think, I mean, that's pretty clearly not what's happening here. Right? So you could also make some other uh, comparisons. You can look at, you know, the, so the Sidoff Taylor solution makes concrete predictions for what the velocity profile is behind the shock, what the density profile is, what the pressure is. Those also don't match. Actually, I had a figure on here that showed them, but it, I mean, they're just two completely different things. Okay. So, so something is going on here, something weird, right? So the Sidoff Taylor solution seems to not be describing how the shock is propagating through this power law medium. And so why, so why is that? Okay, and there's a few reasons. One is that the set off Taylor solution ad adopts the strong shock limit. And so what that means is that the velocity of the shock itself is much greater than the ambient sound speed, the gas into which it's running. And so if you look at these shocks, the Mach number is actually only on the order of a couple. And so the, the pulse that you form uh, generates the shock just at the edge uh, of the helium core. For the majority of these cases and with the energies involved, the Mach number that you get as this thing hits the hydrogen envelope is only a couple. Okay, so immediately you sort of break this, this one fundamental assumption of the set-off Taylor solution. The set-off Taylor blast wave also ignores uh, any contributions from gravity. Um, and so here, because the Mach numbers of the order one, 
and the gas is in hydrostatic equilibrium, that's sort of automatically violated because it kind of implies, uh, so the Mach numbers of order one, the gas is in hydrostatic equilibrium, that sort of tells you that the velocity is automatically on the order of the escape speed, right? Hence gravity is kind of important. And then finally, the sort of main motivating factor behind the um, sort of the appeal of the set off Taylor solution is that the energy is exactly conserved, right? So the energy behind the blast wave has to be a conserved quantity. And so what's interesting is that actually that's not true anymore because as the shock is moving out, it's sweeping up not only mass, which, which is a sort of well-known feature of the set off Taylor solution, but it's also sweeping up binding energy, right? So the gas into which the shock is running is bound, right? So it has some negative binding energy. And so as it moves out, you're actually decrementing the total energy budget behind the shock. Okay? So these sort of, these three things sort of conspire um, to sort of make you think, okay, maybe it's, maybe, Maybe it's sort of obvious that the set off Taylor solution wasn't really the, gonna be necessarily the correct answer here. Okay, so how do we, how do we describe this shock propagation then when all these things kind of matter? So is there another form of self-similar solution that we can potentially look for? And the way, sorry. And the way to sort of motivate um, the answer that there might be is that as I said, right, the, the Mach number of these shocks that we're finding is not huge. And so of the order unity, that implies that the kinetic energy is, at, is comparable to the gravitational potential energy. And that sort of means that the velocity is on the order of the escape speed. Okay, V equals root GM over R, where M here is the mass contained in the core of this yellow supergiant. So the hydrogen envelope itself is not really self-gravitating. The vast majority of the mass is contained within the helium core. The envelope is in hydrostatic equilibrium, that also implies automatically that the sound speed is roughly comparable to the escape speed. And so what this sort of suggests is that there's really only one speed in the problem, namely the escape speed. And so it seems reasonable that the shock velocity itself should also correspondingly move at some fraction of the escape speed. Okay, there's, in that way there's only really one uh, speed in the problem. And if you make this kind of assumption, all right, so this fundamental assumption, namely that the velocity of the shock scales as the local escape speed times some unknown number, just call it capital V, which implies that the shock position evolves as T to the two-thirds. And you again make all the same set of self-similar assumptions, namely that the velocity, the density, and the pressure um, scale as their ambient quantities, and the ram speed times some unknown functions of this self-similar variable then what happens is that the Mach number, by construction, is a constant, and so you can satisfy the, the boundary conditions self-similarly. If you introduce, if you insert these expressions um, into the Euler equations, right, these nonlinear partial differential equations, you again, you can recover three self-consistent ordinary differential equations, and then you can just integrate those numerically. Same thing that you do for the set taylor solution, right? And so these solutions work, and they account for gravity and also the, the finite Mach number effects, and also the, uh, yeah, they work. <laughs> okay, if I, if I shove them into the, into the Euler equations and integrate them. And the important thing is that they depend on this parameter that I've introduced here, which is this capital V, right? This unknown, unknown pure number, okay? And so in order to sort of like nail this and figure out uh, if these solutions work and if they're meaningful here, we need to figure out what this parameter is. And so as I said, it's sort of the, it's basically the velocity of the shock, right, normalized by the, by the escape speed. And so for the set off Taylor solution, the, this sort of equivalent thing is just determined from the initial energy, right? So I say I have some known initial conserved energy, and so I can turn around and sort of invert that expression and solve for the velocity of the shock as it moves out. And the reason that works is because the energy is conserved. But as I said here, the, the energy behind this, this shock is not actually conserved as it's going out because it's sweeping up the binding energy. And so here, what you can actually show is that from the, the equations that you derive for F, G, and H, these self-similar functions, there's actually a, a critical point or a sonic point in the flow behind the shock that develops. And in order for the solutions to smoothly pass through this point without doing uh, anything bad, you need a very special value um, of this, this capital V, this, this basically normalization constant uh, that tells you how, how rapidly the shock is propagating. 
And so these solutions um, have some really interesting properties. So, Sorry, I'm, I'm quite confused, so you assume Mach number is constant. Uh, Mach number is constant. Yeah. Well, so the physics is really just saying that there's one in these situations where the Mach number is not enormous. There's kind of just one physical velocity involved in the problem, which is the escape speed, because the ambient medium is in hydrostatic equilibrium. And so hence, the sound speed there is automatically on the order of the, on the order of root gm over r. What's that there? Because I thought sound speed over the state is equal to r. I know I made a mistake in a similar way. You assume a power law on that. Yeah, if you assume a power law, it's exactly. Yeah, that's right. I mean, that's, so this is basically the, like, the assumption of this, of this problem, right? Sure. Yeah. Carbon-cell similarity otherwise. Because you have a solution that covers many orders of length, many orders of length of length. So uh, if, you, if, you want this, if you want this solution to be self-similar, then you can't have the special you know, mark number. But why should it be self-similar? Why doesn't it be more self-similar? Sure. I mean, I'm not saying that, <laughs> OK. So, I mean, these solutions could exist, and fine, right? But as it turns out, these solutions are actually manifested in these, in these solutions. And so it's an interesting question as to what happens when you don't have exactly a constant Mach number or how any sorts of perturbations sort of arise. So again, you start with initial conditions and you have a certain, a certain symmetry. And you expect the solution to have the same symmetry. And since there's no, so, nothing special in the sum rate effect because it's a power, so everything's still the same way, so you don't expect. You don't if I change the power. No. I mean, these well, solutions. If it's steep enough, that, right? If it's steep enough, then it's type two solution. You can actually make it even more super solid. I'm making constant density. I'm turning it So it's so right. So the main the main thing that determines whether or not these solutions exist is actually is related to this density is the the power law index. And so as as the density gets flatter and flatter, the gravitational binding energy of the ambient medium gets to be large, right? And in fact, as it's if this rho goes like r to the minus n. If n is less than or equal to 2, then the gravitational energy is actually infinite. And so what that means is that if you, so sort of the underlying assumption in this model is that implicitly is that the shock can make it to infinity and follow this, this scaling. And in that sort of situation, the shock would need to have an infinite amount of energy in order to do that. And so these solutions actually stop existing once n is less than or equal to 2. And in fact, in the limit that it's equal to 2, it, it uh, converges to the saddle taylor blast wave. But for n greater than 2, these different types of self-similar solutions exist. And also for less than 3.5, and I don't understand why 3.5 is special <laughs> in this case. Yeah. Um, yeah, so, um, right, OK. So uh, what you find uh, for these solutions is that if you, if you make this additional requirement that these solutions pass through this, this critical point, um, what you find is that the, this value v that you recover is actually on the, self consistently on the order of unity, right? So these, these shocks are actually only mildly supersonic in this case, which sort of has to be the case because that was sort of the thing that I was assuming. Um, what's also really interesting is that the fluid velocity immediately behind this shock is outward, as it has to be, because you're satisfying momentum conservation at the shock front. But there's actually a region behind this shock where the velocity actually stagnates, turns around, and falls onto the central object. And so these solutions um, actually approach free fall near the origin. And so these different self-similar solutions yield not only outward motion immediately behind the shock, but also accretion onto the central object behind it and they pass through a sonic point on their way to doing it. So these solutions are almost like uh, combinations between ordinary set off taylor solutions um, and also Bondi-like flow. So is it, is it obvious that we always uh, cross a sonic point, but they, uh, do they always have an inner sonic point, regardless of uh, ideologic in this? Yeah, yes. Yeah, so the, the solutions don't really, if you change gamma with respect to constant n, the solutions don't really change all that much quantitatively. Or qualitatively, for that matter. So now I got a question. So this is sort of like an inside-out collapse. Uh, <laughs> yes, that's right. Out. Yeah, 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 that's right. Yeah. You started off at a spectrum collision. Yep. You gave it a little bit of an opportunity. 
Yeah. So there's basically a. Yeah. Yeah. And so there's essentially like a boundary condition thing that's being implicitly enforced here. That's saying that stuff can fall onto the onto the central black hole. And so if like you replace this with a something with a hard surface, right? Then you'd eventually. I think what would happen is you would have this solution initially, but there'd be you know basically you'd start to yeah there'd be a second one that would come out. And, Pretty much, yeah. Yeah. So it is just interesting that what you're saying is because you gave a little bit of outward push and removed enough pressure support. Yeah, it is. Yeah. Yeah. It, no, I understand that, but usually you have to reduce the pressure behind something, right? That's how you start to set up labs. And he didn't really reduce the pressure anywhere. Yeah. Right. Yeah. It's. So it's kind of cute that it ends up following that. Yeah, I think, so the easiest way, so I think, yeah. Again, I just like to show these simple movies because I think they do a good job of explaining sort of what exactly what this looks like. Right, so if I just hit this thing with a shock, is that it moves out initially, but eventually exactly, it can't, it can't quite escape all the way out to infinity and it just gets. Um, I guess that's the point that implicitly you really have to move all pressure support. Yeah. Right. So Pretty much. So with a special, yeah, with a, yeah. yeah. And so you end up getting, because you got rid of the pressure, you get free fall. That's yep. Get yeah. Um, and you could just compare this to the, the same movie that I showed before, and you get just qualitatively and quantitatively different behavior. OK. So, so does this work? Uh, yes. <laughs> so you see. Um, Pretty clearly, this this exact v goes like r to the minus a half scaling um, as the shock moves out and propagates through this this hydrogen envelope. You can also predict um, the velocity profile everywhere behind this shock. Um, you get, I'd say, pretty good agreement. Um, you can also predict the accretion rate onto the black hole, and so the numerical solution is from is Rodrigo's. Uh, so the solid curve is Rodrigo's numerical simulation. Um, the dash curve is the prediction from the self-similar solution. Um, this vertical dotted line is sort of the time at which you expect this power law to start. And it's just the, the time taken for the fluid element at the base of the hydrogen envelope to fall back to the black hole. Um, yeah, and you can I think you can use them for, yeah, they're nice. And they, they seem to, it, it seems to really fit quite well um, what we see in these, these numerical simulations. Um, and so I don't have any sort of new material. Um, this is just sort of the summarize that, that these failed supernovae create these interesting additional indications um, of the fact that they've failed. Um, these new self-similar solutions, at least in certain cases, seem to, to match uh, what we see from simulations in terms of the shock propagation through this envelope. And I think sort of going forward, it, it's, uh, it's really nice because we can now connect this initial uh, pulse formation and shock formation stage to the eventual outburst. And so I didn't really mention this, um, but you can actually use these solutions. And so, right, so one of the, one of the uh, points about the star having a, a finite surface is that the star has a, uh, right, so these solutions are maintained because there's a, a very detailed balance between the kinetic energy behind the shock and the rate at which you're sweeping up uh, binding energy from the ambient medium. And so if you suddenly run into the surface, there's no more binding energy there. And so you can actually sort of compare the kinetic energy behind these self-similar solutions to the radius in the star at which you suddenly uh, will run out of binding energy. And you predict at that location, that's sort of the amount of mass that will be successfully ejected. Um, and that, those sorts of estimates agree very well. Um, so for this yellow supergiant, for example, you predict that about a tenth of a solar mass should be ejected. Um, and you can compare that to what you would expect if you just conserve the initial energy um, and if you do that, you overestimate the true result by a factor of about 10, um, if you just assume the energy is conserved. Um, and you can also make predictions for the, the late time fallback, uh, which I think could have some really interesting implications. Um, you know, if the material has any small amount of angular momentum, you can circularize and form a disk and create some interesting um, transients. So with that, uh, thank you for your attention, and I'll take any questions. Um, you didn't say exactly how your velocity coefficient was uh, varying as a function of the. You have the yep. 
bigger as the power law gets steeper. So how is that? Uh, yeah. That's right. And is that related to the transition from yes. the flow to stop shock? Yep. So once you, so that's right, yeah. And I, I, didn't, I didn't put those, uh, those plots in uh, this talk. Uh, they are in this, in this paper. That's too long, but you know. <laughs> uh, so as the, right, so as the N, as the density, uh, as the power law gets closer to two, the shock essentially needs more and more kinetic energy in order to make it make it out under this self-similar prescription. And so correspondingly, the velocity that you get sort of asymptotes to infinity um, as you get really, really close to n equals two. I don't remember exactly, I don't remember if there's like a, a well-defined power law rate at which you approach infinity or anything as n goes to two. I don't, I can't remember off the top of my head, but pretty much as you get like to n of like 2.1, you're back down to the you know, Mach number of order five or so. And then you, you sort of maintain a Mach number between, between one and two all the way out to 3.5. And then for some reason that I don't, I don't understand, at 3.5, these solutions stop existing and the Mach number gets to be exactly one. And in that case, this, the shock actually transitions to a rarefaction wave, which is just basically a little, like, you know, it's not really a shock anymore, just a little pulse that goes out and just tells the gas to fall into the interior. Yeah, but there's a yeah, there's a well-defined uh, variation of this velocity as a function of n. So what happens when you have rotation? Uh, <laughs> a lot of stuff, I would guess. Uh, <laughs> I mean, as so, as long as as long as the rotation is not dynamically important, then I think the majority of the of the evolution is going to be governed by by these you know roughly spherically symmetric um, irrotational. Approximations, um, of course, like angular momentum is conserved, and so at some point you're going to reach. As long as you have enough angular momentum to sustain you outside of the ISCO, eventually you're going to reach um, some new inner, uh, you know, centrifugally balanced accretion disk sort of state. Um, but that's a great question. I mean, I think that's that's another really interesting thing um, that'd be great to look into. Um, probably with you know simulations, yeah. So you, saw, you talked about a new part of solution that's the new part. Mm -hmm. But that's, you know, we saw this internal mass loss, we saw any of this shock yeah. lifting things up, so it was still happening, right? Mm -hmm. So this is saying the shock itself is only important for pushing the algorithm to the layer out. Yes, that's right. Uh, yeah. Yeah, so what's interesting is there's actually, <laughs> so I didn't realize it at the time that we put this paper out, but there is actually kind of a, so there's, the set off Taylor solution, when the Mach number is infinity, there's this solution where the Mach number is on the order one, and then there's a third solution that is this rarefaction solution, um, which is basically like an infinitesimal, the way I think about it is like a shock of infinitesimally small amplitude <laughs> that goes out and just sort of informs the gas without really giving it any kick that there's infall. What, yes, exactly, yes, it's a rarefaction wave that goes out, yeah, yeah. But the shock is sort of the, the consequence of the fact that you have a finite amount of energy that you're initially pushing into this thing. No, so that's part of the, so part of the self-similarity of this sort of automatically maintains that none of this stuff can ever actually leave. Yeah, and so what happens is, in the real problem, I think what happens is that the shock uh, eventually reaches a point in the star where the binding energy above it is not sufficiently uh, large to balance the kinetic energy, and eventually the shock will accelerate um, and actually give rise to some unbound debris, which is, so there's a different type of solution, um, different type of self-similar solution actually, that is, is I think usually seen where the shock accelerates near the surface of the star um, if it goes, basically if it's a, poly a polytropic fall off near the surface, that it self accelerates and then gives rise to the unbound gas with positive kinetic energy. But why is that different from what you said in the first part about the behavior near the surface of a polytropic? It's not different. Right, exactly, yeah. But that's not at the same place, the binary No. No, yeah, that's right, that's right, yes. Yeah, you're absolutely right. And so, so there will be, depending on how sharp the density contrast is, you could go to something that's more like an energy conserving phase earlier in. Yeah, but if you follow this power law, and you're initially, yeah, exactly. But I mean, if you follow the power law and you're in this regime, then you'll always stay in this regime. <laughs> 
It's because the it's because the mass is bound. Um, so the t to the minus five thirds transition occurs when you get to basically when your when your um, apocenter distance is like effectively infinite compared to your initial radius within the star. It seems to me that this is coming from uh, polytron producer, right? Because you assume. Oh, it is. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Rho goes like out of the minus n. So for a different n, this will. Uh, different, uh, different yeah. That's right. Yep. Really yeah. Really so here. They don't have any mass relative to the mass of the center. Yeah. And it's just the run against. What's interesting though is that you What's nice though is that the so like this normalization uh, is different than if you just assume that it was pure free fall, right? You get a different yeah, normalization. Because of the outward motion that you give it initially, yeah. So you delay. Right. Yeah. 